Hey, hey, hello everyone. Welcome to the channel. My name is Paul Sinenko and today we're talking to Demetrius Kelly, who's our in-house uh, assets creator as well as Digilux engineer. So basically he's the one of those rare dudes who can uh, make his own assets and use them as well. So that's a quite valuable skill um, as his design work and his uh, ability to model and render things is uh, always in context of their usability within development environments like Digilux. Uh, so Demetrius and I have worked together for years now and uh, we've uh, we've gone through quite a few iterations of uh, all kinds of uh, ideas and uh, and platforms and so on. Um, so I'll let him basically say a few words about uh, his own experience in Digilogic and now Acuity, um, and then we'll move on to the actual Digilux 5. Uh, why don't you go ahead and do and introduce yourself. Sure, so um, I started doing, uh, I guess, computer graphics back in, in college. I studied computer graphics and illustration. Um, so yes, um, I studied uh, computer graphics um, in college uh, back going back to 2002. Um, so it was computer graphics and illustration. Um, so I then actually moved to Japan. Uh, I did a lot of different uh, odd jobs, um, a lot of which were um, a lot of freelance graphic jobs as well. Um, moved back to the States. Um, 2012 and i believe i started with dg logic around maybe 2013 14 i want to say around there that sounds about right uh that's about as far as my memory goes anyway so and i remember you at that time around that time yeah so um so first off the bat um coming from uh Kind of various freelance work into environment where you you're designing things and and creating things for a specific development platform where they're used in a certain way what are the major changes have you noticed how did you have to adjust your skills or your outlook on things uh basically to make to turn out things that are usable in that environment in that context uh yeah so i completely had to um figure out, I guess, the best way to optimize the actual end images, because I was so used to um, doing high res, uh, super high res things that, of course, the file sizes are, are, are huge. Um, and, you know, DigiLux being web based, I, I definitely had to uh, kind of learn how to uh, shrink things down and, and not get so detailed on, on certain things. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, well, I mean, nowadays, uh, this kind of asset weight uh, battle is not maybe as critical anymore with the kind of network speed being what they are. But, you know, I guess depending on what industry you're making this for, you know, some some areas that are going to remain nameless aren't exactly at the forefront of, uh, of technology. And sometimes you do have to deal with the with very slow modem connections and cell cellular connections on site. Um, where you do want to really be mindful of asset size and weight and so on and so forth. Okay. So, uh, I mean, you do both 3D and 2D work and uh, and the combination thereof. Um, what what are your basically what are your personal feelings about kind of 3D versus 2D? And and right now we're not talking about their usability within certain contexts, but in general your own personal take on things. So like, do you like 3D modeling better, or do you like kind of stylized 2D graphics? What are your preferences internally? Um, you know, my preference is is, is more so um, in the 3D because it's a, a bit more versatile. Um, that, that's kind of the realm that I've I've been in for a while. So if, if, if I I can make something look 2D ish using 3D. I, I tend to do that um, just because I, I feel a little bit more comfortable um, with certain um, graphical things, with as far as that's concerned. Um, that in combination, 2D does have its place, um, but for me, uh, 3D is where it's at, basically. <laughs> I mean, 3D graphics, I, I think, I mean, my personal 
opinion on this. Uh, they look really well and they're really good when they're uh, one off. So they're you know you, when you create a very specific scenario or like a building and specific equipment and uh, and it's all rendered together as one scene. Uh, I think there this three the usefulness of three D renderings within libraries. I feel like novelty of it is starting to wear off, right? This was really like the, you know, the the bee's knees, uh, you know, in you know the 2015, 2014, you know, in those years, where like three D what felt like a leap forward, where oh my god, I can see my children from all the sides, you know. If I want, if I render, if I render, and then when you try to actually work with those graphics, right, connect them and 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 then structure them together into systems, you start really feeling drawbacks. So I, I mean, personally, I was always uh, um, I can't say I was, I'm a proponent of 2D graphics, um, but my preference has always been in t in the flat view of a 3D rendering, right? So so that you get the depth effect uh, with shadows and everything else. Uh, but without that three-quarter view, where where you see it from, like you know, from from the corner somewhere, because then it becomes really difficult to make these renderings work in other environments. Again, if you render like one whole system as one rendering, sure, everything is modeled and it's going to render perfectly. But when you render components that are meant to be put together in another environment, uh, and they're supposed to basically clip together and then create a one coherent system. Of course, it becomes quite a bit more difficult to produce a better looking and functioning system uh, when you have the three quarter views and so on. So this kind of brings us into the the middle ground, the isometric uh, stuff, or I think there was another name for it, but it doesn't yeah, it doesn't come to my head right now. But mm -hmm. but it, it, what I'm talking about is where it's not a true 3D, where basically it's a geometry that would not be possible in real world. Uh, but but yet it's a way to render something to make it actually kind of click with other objects in a, in a, on the same plane, so to say, in 3D space. Right. So can you talk a little bit about that and what's involved in creating a graphic like that? Right. So basically, um, with the isometric view, you're basically getting rid of all the um, uh, vantage points, uh, so to speak. So everything is like. Um, on a plane. So even though it appears 3D, it's really not. Um, you are creating these things with 3D software and rendering them out. So the process is the same, but um, you know the, the way you set up your camera is different. Okay, so um, uh, those particular things, once they're rendered and, and, and set up, they're, they're easier to click together. Um, because they, they run parallel on, on, a, on a straight line. Um, so that could definitely, as far as with making libraries and such, that would be a definite way to go um, if you're interested in doing 3D. Um, so, however, I think, uh, well, isometric is a bit more than just lack of vanishing point. Uh, I, so what I mean is, it's a perspective where you have two uh, dimensions at 90 degrees to each other, and then Z dimension going backwards. Right. right. So basically, an impossible combination of angles. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, a lot of game or a lot of old school games were made like this, right? Where you have these tiles that are kind of facing you perfectly, yet they have the kind of the Z dimension going off at 45 degrees uh, to the back, and. Uh, and I think uh, you, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong. To to create something like this, you cannot create this in uh, 3D environments like 3D Max or most of the software, right? You have to go and then doctor them in like Photoshop, where you literally have to skew uh, renderings, right, to to fix those angles. Is that uh, am I right there? So, on on certain things, on on on, on objects and. In, to an extent, yes. There's a, there's also no. There there are um, there is software out there that will um, create an isometric view for you. Um, but depending upon the object, um, you might have to then go into Photoshop and mod it a little bit or or shape it to to. Work. Well, I just remember the duct work, right? Duct work, uh, like back in the day. 
all right, making a duct work basically have a 3D component to it, yet being flat on a plane so it connects nicely. Uh, was I remember having like going in Photoshop and after the rendering of the pieces is done, going to Photoshop and having to skew it a bit so that you end up with two 90 degree dimensions. That's right. what I'm talking yeah. about. Yes. Yeah. So, example, if I make a chiller, um, you know, that chiller is not like actually, it, it's a chiller, it's not part of a um, uh, puzzle piece, right? And this has to connect to a cooling tower. It's being connected by straight piping, right? Um, whereas the ductwork, it, it has it's like an interconnection of puzzle pieces. Right, right, right. Because you can't just slap another one anywhere. It has to basically, you know, fully right. connect, so, right? Not so in just one spot. With those, then yeah, you would have to go into uh, and, and use uh, additional software, uh, example Photoshop, to kind of shape it to. Um, fit and, and, and do a lot of little tricks to get everything to work properly. Well, let's move on. So when you, uh, okay, when you, let's talk about accuracy of the render. Now, this has always, always been my kind of pain point because um, typically you find uh, clients and often the designers themselves, like the artists who to model things, kind of trying to do very accurate, detailed uh, model of uh, whatever equipment they're working on. And it, it's often lost uh, in kind of the, the fact that you're doing this for a library, right? Not for a very specific situation is often lost uh, on the client. So they, they when they want a chiller, right? Uh, they try to model or ask you to model a chiller with all the bells and whistles. However, when when then library is being used later on um, and he has to use it for to represent slightly different chiller, right? Then questions start it's like where, oh, but my chiller has two compressors here and yours has, uh, you know, three or mine has, uh, you know, these valves in here and yours doesn't and, and so on and so forth, right? So so to me, the the great accuracy of the rendering when you deal with libraries. Right? Again, we're not talking about one-off situations when uh, you you know you render something specific for a project and it reflects that project exactly. Those are set special situations. When you talk about a library that's supposed to be reusable, right? Where do you land on this uh, on the spectrum of uh, stylizing versus uh, kind of accurate rendering, and what's your take on on the kind of drawbacks and benefits of each. Right, so um, I only really deal with um, uh, completely accurate pieces if the customer requests them. Um, if they don't, I try to make uh, things general. I attempt, try to attempt to generalize things. So if you have a chiller and um, they don't know the specific model number of the chiller and, and they kind of don't care. I will make it look like a generic chiller, uh, maybe stylize it a bit, um, as well as the animation, because I don't know how big or small the, the, the actual end piece is going to be. So, you know, to, to render something with all the lights and uh, the, the, uh, all the pumps and everything, 100% um, accurate would be extremely lost and kind of irrelevant um, in, in most cases, especially if you're making it for a chiller plant. So it's going to end up being very small. Um, so I have had projects where clients were specifically, uh, we have this model number cooling tower or this model number chiller, I need this specific thing. Um, and then, you know, I'll go in, get the plans and make it, <laughs> so to speak. Um, but that does take a, a bit a amount of time as well uh, to accomplish that. And it's kind of a balance. Yeah, I mean, the fact that many of those details kind of get lost in the scaling anyway, is, I guess is one thing. Again, my issue has always been, um, you know, the more the more details you add, the more complaints you get later when those details don't match the field exactly. This is right? why so I tend when, to keep things general. Right. So <laughs> when, when building, so 
today, right? Today, my preference is not even uh, a realistic representation of an equipment uh, that I prefer. I really like uh, st stylized, al almost cartoony representation. And I can, uh, or I don't know if iconic is the right word, but basically more like a, a more like an icon representing something rather than actual image of the equipment uh kind of does a better job at keeping everyone satisfied right first of all it doesn't take away take too much attention away from the actual data right because in the end we have to be mindful of the fact that we're building this right to display important data right and to aid decision making so your graphics uh i don't think they should overpower the data you're trying to display Right, right, uh, right. And, no. and in graphics with a bunch of details, definitely crowd the screen to the point where it's difficult to pick things out. Um, and uh, and also, like I said, I think the like the detailed 3D renderings are left somewhere in early kind of 20, uh, you know, well, you know 2012, 2015s, right? Uh, this right. day. I mean, this day and age, you're not going to surprise or wow anyone with uh, with a good looking 3D graphic, right? Going with photorealism is completely mute point in my view because at that point, just get a photo, right? And uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and yeah, I think the well made stylized representation of an equipment uh, would always be more useful than a detailed rendering of that same piece of equipment. But that's my view, right? And and once once I explain it to kind of prospective uh, clientele, people tend to agree with that, right? But but the initial the gut uh, initial kind of desire is like, oh yeah, I want details, you know, bunch of details. It's only when you start thinking about it, or I'm talking about clients here, when they start thinking about it, it's like, do I do I really want all those details and all those rivets and bolts on my graphics? Because right. you know what, in most cases, no, not really. So, anything you want to add to this? Because I, I know for some reason I end sure, up talking sure. most of this. Yeah, that, I mean, I totally believe that. Um, um, you know, I, I tend to try and make things that fit the project at, at, at hand, right? Um, so, if the UI design calls for something to be a bit more um, detailed, then then so be it. Um, if if the UI design t tends to be a, a bit more iconic and um, more text driven, um, then of, of, of course, you, you know, I would, the, the 3D needs to be subdued uh, big time or, or pulled back. Um, but uh, th there's always going to be, I think, a place for it. Um, not necessarily maybe in, in chiller plants because, you know, those things can get extremely wild, uh, especially with 3D. I've seen it time and time again where I'm, I'm modeling a, a chiller plant and it's just it looks like a, a spider's nest of of piping just everywhere and you can't see anything. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I think, you know, if you want to uh, go down deeper to each individual piece of equipment. Maybe it has its place. Yeah, I would I would tend to agree with that. Uh, so th yeah, there's definitely time and place for eye candy. Um, I don't think that place is in the library, right? right. So with the, the distributable library, I think is not a place for uh, eye candy for the sake of eye candy. Right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but when you talk about project specific. Uh, renderings, yes, especially where where I really like the details is a splash page like building rendering, right? Uh, like minutes, solar system plan, rendering, where, yeah, because mo almost every project has pages that are dedicated to the eye candy that are meant to grab attention. Uh, you know, they're often kiosk display pages, right? They're splash pages, and there you definitely I think want that eye candy, the, the detailness, and especially if you make the interactive. So when you have kind of high fidelity rendering with details. And then you add interactiveness in Digilux, uh, then it really kind of brings it out and uh, makes it kind of play really well into this uh, wow factor. Um, but yeah, once you get into more uh, technical areas, um, yeah, I think the, us the usability of that starts kind of going down exponentially. 
Right. Well, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about systems, right? So rendering systems or or building sets, right? So the has to do with piping, ducting, right? Uh, other systems that are supposed to interconnect. Um, what 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 are your methods, right? How, like describe your process. How do you like from the from the moment that you get a request, uh, let's say internal request that we're looking for a new piping library, right? And and some basic guidelines of uh, of why we need a new one versus the old one. So what's your process, right? Let's, let's uh, the example scenario would be we need a new water pipe library for for you know for our next whatever version of the product. Mm -hmm. right? so the piping has to obviously be connectable so you can build pipe systems uh, and I don't know maybe adjust color. What 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 are your steps in the process? Where do you go first? Where do you go next? And then how do you execute this? Sure. So first, you have to make a decision on. You know, I, I usually make a decision whether if I'm going to use 2D or 3D with with that. So, and what is the piping going to connect to? Is it going to connect to something that is uh, 3D built? in uh, 3D modeling, or is it some built in a 2D, right? So let's say if um, uh, you have, uh, this piping needs to connect to equipment that is 3D, right? But at the same time, it's piping, right? Um, I'm not going to sit there and maybe render out pipes. <laughs> For it, so probably end up making um, um, SVGs for that, um, or or 2D. Um, I will try and have a kind of 3D effect to it using a gradient, um, but with the SVG, you know, it's easier to uh, change colors and, and and so on with that, as opposed to rendering out PNG files or image files. Um, which you can't really change the color for. Um, so that, it's kind of like you have to decide um, what's your end goal. What is um, the what is everything going to link to, and will it look almost seamless? Because that's you're also trying to make things look seamless as well. All right. Well, that and also. Um can reduce number of puzzle pieces that user has to use, right? But basically analyzing where you can make a stretchable piece, right? Or where you're gonna have to stay with a, with a small, like when, when you talk about 90 degree corner, right? Those are, you can't really stretch it that much. You just have to grab it and add it to a screen. But when right. you talk about, let's say, a vertical or horizontal piece, there's no need to make the user, you know, drop one after another after another just to make a longer piece, or, you know, you can look into making them stretchable um, and that, of course, gets involved in the figuring out how they should be stretched, right? Whether it has any graphical, anything rendered in that would uh, hurt stretching, right? Whether right. It, you know, so it gets... that's the other thing you do have to concern yourself um, uh, when you're um, dealing with image files that you've rendered is you have to make sure that if you're going to stretch something that that piece needs to be seamless. So you, in other words, you're kind of making a seamless texture, in other words, because it has to replicate and duplicate itself over and over again. So if you have like one pixel that's there, it's that one pixel is just going to repeat and it's going to look extremely weird. So <laughs> We've seen those before, yes. Okay. Okay, so so you made those decisions. You figured that out. Uh, what's next up? So you you go into you jump right into your three D uh, graphics tool, or do so you do you do any sort of? So if I'm going to uh, make make the piping in three D, what's going to happen is um, I'm going to model um, basically uh, if it's piping. I will model kind of like a square section of it. Uh, so you have basically your straight piece, your um, so your straight horizontal, your straight vertical, uh, and then you have your end caps. Um, and then with your end caps, I also make T 
sections to replace with the um, L shapes. So you have your L shapes, your T's. Um, if you need a um, cross section, I would add that in as well. So you do um, that in 3D modeling? Software, so I would do or? that in the 3D modeling software. So okay. after that, I would actually put them, after I have a square, I would actually move them into the same exact space. Um, because what's next is the, the lighting part, right? So after you uh, run your material, which is usually like a metal type material, um, uh, you know, you light it. So I usually put it in one, one space so they all have the same lighting. And then I'll render them out separately um, into their own separate image file. And I imagine you use, a you use a directional light, right? So you don't have a spotlight effect so that everything gets so, lit. Actually, with something like that, um, I actually use, um, um, depending upon what I'm doing, I will use two different uh, softwares. So uh, things like that, I tend to use a software called Keyshot, which is basically um, an HDR lighting thing. It's really simple. I don't have to sit there and kind of figure out uh, this spotlight here and this and so on. Uh, I just throw it in, move the light to kind of a perpendicular thing. So it's just flat lighting and then render it out. Uh, it saves a lot of time in, in rendering things like that. Okay, so basically you model in 3D Studio Max, as I understand, and then you just export it to Keyshot to do your lighting and materials, or? Yes, for 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 that particular um, instance. Gotcha. Um, so also too with maybe your basic equipment like chillers and and, and so on, um, you can get really nice effects too, as far as. Um, if you want to make things look realistic, um, it has a bunch of uh, material libraries already, so I don't have to worry about texture mapping. So I could just throw materials on uh, different. So, how long does a library like that take? So, because I mean, I think everyone is more or less aware of what's inside a water piping library, right? So, like, you know, your piping and then probably valves, right, and a few other objects that are part of that. How long does a set like that take from the con from conception, right, of you getting down the request to make one to the deliverance? Um, what is that lifetime of this project, the lifespan? So just like for piping? Uh, Let's say yes. P piping and associated things like sensors that go into pipes, uh, you know, valves that go into pipes, like not the equipment, right? Not the chillers or anything like that. But right, right. Water so, yeah, that's, and, that's and excess another things. animal. Yeah. So like um, the, the piping and such really doesn't take so long and maybe about um, uh, depending uh, three days to a week. Sounds fair. OK, all right. Uh, so let's switch gears and talk about clients a little bit. Uh, <laughs> now, you don't get, you don't get to uh, always have direct access to to the end client. But you do sometimes, right? It, it, yeah. it depends yeah. on the dynamics of the project. So, in those cases where you when you do when you can talk to the to the client and then kind of have a on demand conversation about kind of to verify something or to get more details, um, how do you manage a client basically? So if you know if you're you know if a client comes in saying you know we want to develop these very various libraries for our new product that we'll be coming out with and you know obviously you tasked with that job um explain your process of managing a client right how do you because there'll always be some ideas that the client may have that are terrible right um and and you that you somehow need to communicate to them and and, and so on so explain your client management process because how do you address uh situations where you don't think client is going the right way, right? What if they get a bit pushy? Like, what are your methods to kind of resist that? Uh, or or do you tend to not to basically? How do you deal with various uh, client related uh, situations? Um, so there have been times where, um, you know, clients of I have 
butt heads a little bit as far as um, uh, some design um, ideas and, 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 and so on. Um, what I tend to do is I tend to make a sample of what they're talking about. Throw it up and show them and, and explain why I think this is not um, uh, the way to go. Um, again, it's not like a full blown finished piece, but it, it's something that I, I tend to throw together just to kind of show um, how uh, I think it, it, it should go. And uh, usually after they, they see that, they usually tend to be like, oh, OK, <laughs> and then kind of flip and change. Um, if not, um, uh, you know, some I've, I've had times where clients have won. <laughs> and I kind of I said, OK, uh, I'll, I'll we'll go this way. Um, so um, it, it really depends. I, I, I try to not bend over, but at the same time, so to speak. But at the same time, I tend to uh, try and work with because at the end of the day, it's their project. Um, I'm just there to kind of make their vision uh, a reality, so to speak. Um, I'd like to think that I tend to uh, try to put uh, my work and in, in myself into it a little bit, but at the end of the day, that's it. It's their show. Yeah, after all, they pay, right? So they technically they can get whatever they want yeah. within the lot of funds. Yeah, but, but sometimes, time. you know, so yeah, and I mean, we've all been there, right? And sometimes you just see that funds are not being kind of used in the, on the, in the, in the most efficient way. And uh, sometimes you can show and demonstrate that to the client, convince them, and sometimes you just can't. And you, there have been times, uh, I'm sure, in your, uh, in your career as well, where you're forced to do the, you know, the wrong way, or at least the way you plan once, only to when you're done to finally demonstrate that this was not the right way to do it. And unfortunately, yes, at, at that did. time, you know, it's already <laughs> been built. <laughs> it's already been built and paid, right? But uh, you know, and uh, sometimes you just have to go back saying, "Look, you know, we've uh, we've talked about this, and uh, it's one of those bittersweet situations where you get vindicated on one hand. On the other hand, uh, you know." We don't want those situations where, you know, you, you have to come back and ask for more funds to do it the right way next time. So. Yeah, I, I try to avoid that, but sometimes it's unavoidable. It happens. It happens. Um, so, you know, kind of to wrap things up, um, if you wanted to say something to all the prospective clients out there to make their future orders as smooth, as painless as possible, uh, when it comes to running and executing the project and getting what they need delivered. And I, like, you know, I want to especially underline not what they want, but what they need. And there's usually a big gap between what they want and what they need. Yeah. Um, what, what would you tell them? How would you describe your perfect project that would make things easier for them, for you, for timelines, and for budgets? So you mean like the, what they're going to deliver to me, to yeah. Me. What what do you expect from them? Okay. Right? What kind of what kind of support do you expect from them in interaction? What kind of non interference do you expect from them? Right. <laughs> so basically, like I said, if you had to describe your perfect project, how would you describe it? Sure. So um, with as 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 far as things I I, I get. So example, if we have a floor plan. Um, you know, I, I, I've gotten everything from little drawings on napkins uh, to full blown AutoCAD files um, with the whole building attached just for a floor plan. Um, I don't. <laughs> yeah, with, I, those, with every outlet marked on it. Yes. You know? <laughs> you know, I don't want that. Um, really, realistically, all I need is a, a PDF. Um, a simple PDF. I don't need the electrical diagrams and, and all that. Just a PDF of the floor plan, depending upon um, the level of detail that you want. And sorry to butt in there for a sec, but with the, with CADs, I just you know that, that's one of uh, well, it used to be my pain point is like people tend to think like the more detailed the 
cat is, the easier it is for you to turn it into yeah, a floor Yeah, it's brand. really and not. Even, it's really not. To understand, but just to clean it up, like uh -huh. to the walls, Right, because what you need to make a floor plan is walls, basically. That's it. So yes, you can extrude a CAD, but to clean it up, right, from full detail level to just the wall, so you can extrude it, could be longer than drawing those walls from scratch. Correct. So, so all, just, I, I just, all I really want that. is the PDF, and I'll just draw the walls myself. Exactly. I don't need to extrude your walls. <laughs> um, and that goes for anything. That goes for your chiller plants. That goes for your um, equipment diagrams. Um, it, for your equipment, I d you know, I don't really need a diagram for that. Um, I need the model number and the company that makes it. I'll I'll Google it, find an image, and we'll make it. I don't need all of the, all of that other stuff. Um, that's the my biggest pet peeve. <laughs> um, the other thing is, um, basically, I, I do like input, um, but, you know, uh, at the same time, uh, let it cook cook, uh, so to speak. I, I, I'm where I'm at for a reason. I know what I'm doing. Um, so, um, you know, let, let me be to my own devices. You'll come out with a, a good project. Let me actually, again, I'm going to butt in there because I, I think I can rephrase what you said. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, I don't think you're just not looking for any sort of input. I, I think no, no, what, no, 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 no. all of us are looking the kind of input that all of us are looking for, even me with you know development side and you in the graphics, is what are you trying to achieve with that, right? So we so we can figure out how do we need to do for you to achieve that, right? So So the valuable input is how you're planning to use it, Right. And where do you envision using it? Not necessarily how it should look and, you know, and, and how to cut the pieces. Right. Just mm -hmm. explain how and where you intend to use it. And, uh, you know, in this case, Demetrius has years of experience to take that and th from that figure out how to best cut it up, how to best render it, how to best basically make it so you can use it in a way you intend to use it. Right? Like, uh, that's the kind of it, but that's always very valuable. Like, do we actually need graphics? You know, sometimes a uh, table list is sometimes the best way uh, to show something, right? So it, it really depends. It, yeah, it really depends. Like I said, not, I don't think there's a single professional out there that, that likes it when, uh, when his clients start uh, kind of giving him ideas <laughs> how to do right. this stuff. Uh, but I think at the same time, almost every professional out there would always want the input of, again, how the client is planning to use whatever he's asking you to build so that you can make the best decisions using your own expertise in the field for the client to make sure the product you're providing is best usable in those situations for the client. Great. Well, that, that brings us to, to the end right in the queue. So uh, appreciate the, sharing your, your wisdom here. And I know Thanks for having me. We're exchanging wisdom uh, quite often between the two of us, uh, but you know now this time you let the the whole wide world uh, peek into who Demetrius Kelly is and what he does. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we didn't even get into the the tattoo side of your of your uh, career. <laughs> we'll, I didn't know we'll if you wanted that. me to talk about that. <laughs> we'll keep that for uh, maybe for a part two at some point. Uh, yeah. But uh, but there is that, just so you know. There, there's more to Demetrius that meets the eye, or in this case, meets the webcam. Yeah. Anyway, well, thanks a lot, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk again. Uh, and uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in.